review, like overview of uh, awake craniotomy, neuro mounting for awake craniotomy, uh, because this topic is going to be covered again by James is giving a presentation, so I'm going to skip that part. So awake surgeries are performed in the same manner as convention craniotomies. The main difference of the is that patient is awake throughout the surgery. Uh, this is a preferred technique for lesions near involving the elegant tissue in the brain. It allows us to test function before and after and during the resection, and it minimizes the overall risk of all the surgeries. So every time that, uh, there's a tumor in the uh, allocant tissue, motor area, sensor area, especially language area, then we do awake craniotomy. And in awake craniotomy, the dura is the most pain uh, painful area. So the incision is made and the brain is exposed while the patient is intubated, uh, not intubated, sedated. And once we reach the brain, the patient is, uh, wakes up and then we can talk to the patient and get the uh, information. So intraoperative monitoring, uh, multimodality monitoring with sensory and motor mapping as as electrocardiography uh, is, is used for uh, monitoring the central area near the central sulcus. What, are the, what is the main goal of that? So the main goal of doing the monitoring in awake craniotomy is to preserve the vital brain function, especially motor function and uh, language and motor function, precise localization of sensory, motor, language, uh, and epilepsy area, and max maximizing extent of resection while avoiding any new deficit. So awake craniotomies are done for resection of tumor near the language area, near the motor area, and for epilepsy surgery, and also for deep brain stimulation, implanting the implant for deep brain stimulation. Uh, protective neuromonitoring for identification of neural function. Again, uh, we also use neuromonitoring for therapeutic mapping for epilepsy surgeries and also therapeutic mapping for placement of grid for pain relief and deep brain stimulation for treatment of Parkinson, dystonia, essential tremor, epilepsy, OCD. All these are FDA approved. Uh, so, intraoperative monitoring during awake neurosurgery provide a real time feedback identification of the sensory motor language area and subcortical area. There are different type of uh, brain tumors uh, and the tumors, it depends where, what is the origin of the tumor. So the tumors are uh, originating from meninges, they are known as meningiomas. The primary tumor, they arise from the normal brain tissues and they are called glial cells, they are known as glioma. The tumors, they are secondary or they are metastatic tumor. They can arise from any other place and they are um, met, um, metastasized in the brain and, and most often from lungs, breast tumors, abdominal and skin cancer and bone cancer. So the origin of the cell, glial cell is glioma. From astrocyte is astrocytoma, oligodendrocyte, oligodendroglioma. Ependymal cell is ependymoma. Neurons, uh, ganglioglioma and ganglioneuroma. From pineal cells is pineocytoma, pineoblastoma, reticuloendothelial cells, primary cerebral lymphoma, and the vascular cells gives hemangioblastoma. So all the names of the tumor, so when you walk in and taking the history, uh, just looking at the, if it's glioma, that means it's the origin is glioma, it's the primary tumor arising from the glial cell. If a patient has ependymoma, it's right from ependymoma cell. So electrical stimulation of the cortex was uh, 1874. So uh, so the stimulation of the human originate from the uh, uh, invention of electricity. So when electricity was created, somebody touched and got shocked and that was stimulation. That was first neuromonitoring experience. Uh, so the neuromonitoring has backed up like 200 years. Uh, so there was, uh, I don't have the name, there's an, another author. So he published data in 1866 that uh, if you stimulate a brain, of a person, it, uh, sorry, brain of a monkey, it moves their hand on the other side. That was 1866. So he got hold of a, like a monkey with the ex exposed brain due to some break and he started stimulating. And uh, there's another study in 1800s, late 1890s, stimulation of the brain of humans and getting some responses, but that patient died after that, so. Uh, but recently the OGM, the Penfield is the, the new, is a f one of the famous neurosurgeons. So in 1959, he published paper in uh, almost, I think, 300 patients by uh, language mapping, stimulating the brain and identifying the other language area. Ojeman uh, published initial paper in late, and then 89, identifying the cortex essential to the language. So the awake craniotomy is done for epilepsy surgery, 
tumor uh, atrial malformation, movement disorders and other cases. So, so sensory mapping, uh, the different techniques, sensory mapping, uh, James, is, Sam James is going to talk about the technical side. So we do phase reversal to identify the central sulcus. So if the tumor is somewhere here, uh, most of the time if there's no neuromorting and you're not doing mapping, you look at the, the surgeon look at the other side and say, okay, where is the central sulcus? If the central sulcus is here on the left side, it should be here on the right side, but which is not always true because uh, you can look at the MRI and when you open the, on, uh, the when you do craniotomy, you look at the, the surgeon is looking at the brain and on the brain, so uh, I'll just give you an example. And I, I went to surgery and this, I asked the surgeon, okay, this is a tumor. Uh, where are you going to go? So okay, the tumor is in the primary motor area. I'm going to go to gyrus anterior and I'm going to wide motor area, pre-motor area and do the resection. I said, okay, let's do mapping. So when you did mapping, the surface area was same. The, the sulc primary central sulcus, pre-central gyrus, they were at the same position, but the functional area, it moves to gyrus anterior. So without monitoring, he would have gone straight through the primary motor area. So I said, okay, I'm glad I did have a mapping, but so the functional area, so the anatomical area can be same or different, but the functional area can be different. The tumors can push, this tumor can push them. We don't know, it's pushing without functional testing. We don't know this tumor is pushing the motor area anterior or posterior or medial or lateral. So that can only be done by mapping of the brain. And then we have sensory mapping and motor mapping. The sensory mapping is done to identify the central sulcus and central the sensory area of the brain. Once we identify the central sulcus and sensory area, we can stimulate the motor area and identify the motor area. Uh, how we do that? So we put the grid on the brain and then stimulate the contralateral median nerve and, and we get a phase reversal. But uh, this, is, this is a one by eight grid. So we have one by eight grid and you can see this. This is the pre-motor response. Pre-motor response is down and up and post-central is N20 is up and down. So you have phase reversal between one, two and one and two. So two is the closest to central sulcus, three is farther and fourth is the farther. So this is the central sulcus. The problem with the single grid is that you think that the central sulcus is a straight line, which is never a straight line, it's a curved line. So, so the better to do is two by four grid or have a bigger grid so you can see how it goes. <coughs> And this response you can see on uh, regular SSCP. If you are not measuring the head again, we did an uh, exercise yesterday. You put, the, you put the electrode one centimeter anterior to the central sulcus, you're going to get uh, down and up peak. And we have, <coughs> we should send that uh, pictures to everyone. We have a case where the person was monitoring, have the phase reversal in regular SSCP, but they were marking this response as N20 and this response as P30, instead of this 20 and 30. And if you're monitoring this, this is N20, this is not N20, this is, N, uh, this is N18, which is coming from thalamic response. We have P16 and N18. So if the patient has stroke uh, in thalamocortical radiation or, or in cortex, you're not going to pick up anything because you are monitoring the wrong peak. So if you look at the stack, you'll see the changes, but if you're not looking at stack, you'll not see the changes. Again, another, so you uh, have a phase reversal here between one and two, pre-central down and up and up and down. Uh, we wrote a paper from uh, UVA uh, in 2011 uh, about a P25 response. So this is an extra response which is produced only on the somatosensory gyrus in hand area. So if you get a P25 response, that grid is right on the hand area. Uh, because you can put the grid any place on the central sulcus and you'll get a phase reversal. It doesn't mean you're on the hand area. So because when you stimulate a median nerve, the signal is produced in a specific area in the brain and the central sulcus is very long, five, six centimeter. You put the grid on any place on central sulcus, you'll get a, a phase reversal. But when you're, the grid is close to the, that hand area, you, you'll see the P25. And that's, that's a uh, radial response because 20 and 30 is tangent and P25 is radial to that. So this is a picture from that paper. Uh, we have two by four grid. You have grid number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, you see you have pre-central pre response, pre-central with P25, and then post-central, which look like pre-central, but it's post-central because it's more deflection downward than upward. And this is N18 response, it's a thalamic response. Uh, and then have, so phase reversal between two and three, and then seven and eight. So grid is going sulcus. But if you have only one by four grid, 
you will make a straight line. And on this grid, you can see the, grid, the phase reverse, the center circus is, is curved. So once you have that, so many times, like even when you're communicating with the neurosurgeons, you tell them, okay, this is pre-central, this is motor responses, and we always get mis, uh, uh, understood because they think that this is a motor response. So this is not a motor response. You can take a brain out, motor area out, gyrus, you'll still get these responses because you are, these responses are originating from the cent post-central gyrus, but they are picked up by uh, a grid on the uh, pre-central area. So the responses are produced in the post-central area, but are picked by, these are recorded on the uh, pre-central area. So in order to confirm the motor area, we have to stimulate the motor area. And there are two different type of methods. Uh, one is fast stimulation, one is slow frequency, high frequency and low frequency. The old Penfield method, method is uh, slow frequency 50 hertz stimulation for three, four seconds, but it has a very high risk of having uh, seizures. Um, and now the new one, Taniguchi method, is uh, high frequency. So the Penfield method is 200, 400 pulse width microsecond stimulating at 50 hertz for two to three seconds up to four seconds and looking for responses you can go up to start from two milliampere and maximum is 20 milliampere or if you see after discharges if the patient starts seizing if patient starts seizing at 12 or 10 to 18 or 15 you stop there if you don't it doesn't seize then you can go up to 20 milliampere this maximum so if you're stimulating with the pen field uh, you see a response because this is a response at 4.3 milliampere very short train this is a stimulation artifact in e electrocardiography. The grid is EEG recording from the brain, and this is spontaneous EMG. You see multiple responses because we are doing 50 hertz stimulation. There are 50 stimulation for 200, um, uh, three second, four second. That means there are 200, uh, 200 pulses. And if you look at this, is 10 millisecond per division. So the the time between each response is 20 millisecond, which is same as frequency. F uh, frequency of 50 hertz is 20 millisecond ISI. That's the uh, filter setting for electrocardiography. Another one, so you have spontaneous EMG, triggered EMG, and then electrocardiography. You can see the stimulation artifact for uh, one, one and a two seconds. As follow, patient has after discharges, you can getting more and more. You can see, when you see the patient after discharges, so you have to make sure you don't stimulate between them until they disappear. And we inform the surgeon uh, and circulator immediately, and they need to have a slush machine, which is ice saline, not the regular saline. And ice saline is a slush machine, so it, uh, it, you, you put, uh, pour the normal sodium chloride, uh, and it make it slushy. If you put it, and uh, when you apply that to the brain directly, it inhibits the spread of seizures to the other area. So if, you, if the area is spread, Beyond that, then that application of isoline is not going to work because it's not f localized to that stimulation site anymore. So you have to do very, very quickly. Once it's spread to the other hemisphere or the more area of hemisphere, then you have to do intravenous uh, uh, propofol bolus or sometimes they give muscle relaxation, which is not good, but propofol. And then you cannot do monitoring because patient is totally bus suppression and have total deep anesthesia. We do spontaneous EMG from all the contralateral muscles, upper extremity, lower extremity. Going to the language area, language area, there are two language area, Broca's and Wernicke's. So Broca's area is more interior, it's more close to the motor area, Wernicke's is more posterior. Broca's areas have three sub area. So when we do language mapping, so we go and talk to the patient in preoperative area. We monitor, uh, we take a baseline with this patient because a patient cannot do something as has a deficiency in one thing we cannot test in the OR. So you have to make sure those those items are not included in the testing. So we get the baseline. Uh, for example, we show them a picture, and if the patient cannot identify a picture of um, car, ball, motorcycle, something, we don't use that in the OR. So we take out those pictures from our, our uh, from set. So pars apicularis, uh, Broca's area, pars triangularis is a more triangular shape. Uh, then have prefrontal cortex and pars orbitalis. Wernicke's has posterior superior temporal area, or PSTG, and angular gyrus and supramarginal, and then the other language area are basilar temporal language area, arcuate fibers, and superior aspect of it. The arcuate fibers are the fibers, they connect the two brocas and con connect here. So if you are able to identify brocas and Wernicke and have no damage, but these fibers, they are connecting, they are damaged, 
then the patient will not be able to have language deficiency. So we not only have to identify the brokers and uh, Wernicke, we have to identify the arcuate fibers, which are connecting fibers between the, those two areas. And there are arcuate fibers, they connect between the, the auditory area to the, this area and the visual area to this area. So for brokers, again, inferior frontal gyrus is more inferior. So you see this one, the first one, more most posterior one is opercular. Uh, pars opercularis, the, the triangular shape is pars triangularis and the most anterior one is orbital part. Any damage caused to this area will have aphasia. Aphasia means patient will not be able to speak because your central sulcus here is anterior to that, there's a motor area and that's responsible for speech So uh, and all these area. So patient, if the damage is in Broca's area, patient will not be able to talk. Wernicke's area is posterior and if that is damaged, it will result in impaired speech comprehension patient will be fluent but paraphasic speech. So you'll not be able, patient will be keep talking but it will be all junk so you have no idea. And patient will think that he's talking and you're not understanding. From patient side, he, he or she think that she, that person is talking normally but you don't understand what they're saying. So these are the fibers again, arcuate fibers. So when you're stimulating, um, so, the assen so they have essential uh, areas are identified by cortical stimulation and uh, and they are indis indispensable for function, so we cannot resect on that. Uh, any deficit due to will do result in injury. The involved area, uh, they are identified by multiple tests like um, uh, MER, functional MRI, uh, involved in cortex can be resected. Uh, no postoperative deficit, so there are no postoperative deficit if you are doing resection there. The plan when we walk into that, that's our plan. We do preoperative language evaluation, we look for deficit. Uh, patient has any deficit or have no deficit. Interoperatively, you take the same test. We do interoperative mapping. We do cortical sensory mapping. James is going to talk about more of that, uh, how we do that. And then cortical motor mapping, and then we do cortical language mapping. <coughs> so these are the different, f uh, t every area has a different test. So yeah, you can take a printout or try to, we do again and again, and then you remember. So for, for popular S, uh, which is the most distal, the function is classic speech production. And any deficit in that will cause complete speech arrest or hesitation or, st or stumbling during production. So it, it, it's, n it's not always complete speech arrest. Sometimes patient is uh, stuttering or patient have hesitation to start. So that couldn't be part of that. Um, I did one patient, so I went to the OR and she was 65 year old, old lady and she had a tumor in uh, Wernick uh, Broca's area and was resected, but she, so when I showed her picture of uh, rain, uh, actually rain and comb, so she was trying to tell me by signs and everything, but she couldn't s remember that. So I said rain, she said yes, rain. The word was in the memory, but she couldn't recall. So I showed her brush, uh, she was trying to brush her hair and show everything. Uh, I was thought I was in a reality show or something, but I couldn't. Then I said brush, she said yes, brush, okay. So my time was up. So, so that was uh, uh, so. How we test that? We ask the patient to count one, two, three, four, five. If they can count one to ten, twenty. Call alphabet. Uh, ask them to uh, read alphabet. Uh, days of the week, month of the week. So we do different. They are all speech related, but we alternate. So we are not just um, uh, doing on one testing. Uh, uh, month of the month of the year preposition and object naming to show them the cards and picture. So those are the, if the, that apricularis is damaged, so you can have either have a classic speech arrest, you can have failure to produce words. It can also raise hesitation and slurring of so. The second one in the middle, uh, pars triangularis, the function is associated with classic speech production and any deficit in this one will have uh, aphasia or loss of difficulty. Uh, with production and category of the words. So again, the same test, object naming, counting, days of the week, so we use that one. Uh, Pars orbitalis, which is most anterior, the function associated with word production and development. Often the function is specific to nouns, words, and subcategory of nouns. So, so this area is more specific to nouns and words. So if you ask them to test them, you ask them, okay, what are the favorite topics, pizza toppings? Okay, cheese, pepperoni, chicken, grill, whatever. So those are, and then we make sure we name that. So if, you, or if you tell, or you tell them the uh, top, uh, the different pizza topping, and ask them to uh, repeat that, 
uh, or show the picture and identify them. Uh, and also different nouns like uh, showing the pictures and identification. Uh, ask to repeat the words, asking them to uh, repeating sentences, noun production and verb production. The car is driven by, uh, the plane is, was f is flown by, so fill in the blank, so they have action word in that too. And if that area, is specific area is damaged, patient will have little paraphysic errors, verbal, so even patient will not be able to write in the writing, they have a paraphysic error. They have verbal paraphysic errors, they have nonsense words, slurring, hesitation, and arrest may occur in that area. And then you have STGs or uh, superior temporal gyrus, is again uh, responsible for classic auditory language comprehension with primary input from auditory module. So this area has input from auditory area. So if you tell them to, uh, uh, the sentence completion, you ask them to s complete a sentence or f uh, ask them to f uh, repeat the phrase or ask them to tell them the name of the object and ask them to repeat, they will not be able to do, to do that because that auditory, but if you show them, they will be able to identify because the sh when they look at the picture, they have a feedback from the language, uh, the uh, visual area. So this is the feedback from the auditory area. So the auditory area, it's all about listening and repeating. And when, th and patient, uh, if the patient has a damage to that, or patient have a surgery done, or because of the tumor, patient will say, okay, could you repeat that? Patient will say, I didn't understand what you're saying. Or uh, they will select the wrong word. Uh, Wernicke's area, they have angular gyrus, and that's, uh, it get visual input related to language, so it has an input from the uh, from the visual area. Uh, STG has visual input from the auditory area. Uh, Angular gyrus has input from the visual area. Uh, so if there's a if this is damaged, it will base on the deficit. So and again, patient will saying it's hard to see. I cannot see the words. There's something wrong with the words, or or they will have a kind of aphasia, paraphasia, or hesitation to say that. But that hesitation will not be due to Broca's deficit because of Wernicke's because they cannot identify the structure through the naming. So, so for the uh, for the angular, so for the visual area, so even it's, it's very interesting. But when the kid is born, a child is born, whatever picture they first see, they is imp, uh, implanted in the brain, and everything else they see, they they refer that to that that picture. This is mother or first person they see the mo mother and they see the father they say okay this is not mother this is father this is not mother this is brothers so everyone is referenced to that if you d if you take out that part of the brain it's a less than micrometer they cannot identify any st any any other person but when you talk to them they will identify you because they because that identification imprint obligation is on the visual area but they already their auditory feedback is intact so they can identify the sound auditory feedback but they will never be identified Again, uh, inferior temporal gyrus, uh, object naming, and any damage to that will object naming failure. So they'll not be able to, uh, arcuate fibers, again, they are all the fibers, they're connecting all these area together. So we, so uh, the main point is to identify the Broca's area and the three part of the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area and STG and angular gyrus in that area, and then follow the, um, the fibers that are connected to each other. So neuro monitoring is the key. Again, awake cranium, we don't have a problem with the muscle relaxant or a gas agent because patients are awake. So those are very good cases to do motor mapping. So sensory mapping is difficult because patient is awake and you start stimulating, patients start feel feel pain. So sensory mapping, we always do before they wake up the patient. So we do phase, uh, phase reversal and then once the patient is awake, then you are good to go uh, with the motor mapping. So typical, uh, we have uh, asleep, awake, asleep. They do propofol infusion, remifid, remi, and laryngeal mass anesthesia, LMA, uh, anesthesia given by mask. Uh, local anesthesia for Mayfield pains, and in the uh, for dura, opening dura. Again, dura is the most painful area. Uh, so again, awake, sleep, awake. So when the patient is awake, this is nothing except for anticonvulsant. Uh, when the patient is, is asleep, is on the propofol bolus, dex can be given, uh, narcotics, uh, and anticonvulsants. And when the patient is awake, nothing except for anticonvulsants. So you have to make sure the patient has the bolus of anti-epileptic uh, before the, 
incision or as soon as possible. Even the patient is on, on anti-epileptic because if even the patient, most of the patient, they come with a with the history of seizures or one or two episode of seizures. That's why they got diagnosed. But if even they don't have history of seizure, the stimulate the patient is awake, the threshold is lower. So when we stimulate with 10, 20 million pairs directly, that can and that's the best place and worst place to have a seizure because best place because you have all the drugs available, but worst place patient head is in pins and you can break the neck or something. Surgical positioning, so uh, most of the time, 80, 90% patients, they have language area on the left side, so left side is up, they have the marking. Um, so uh, once the craniotomy is done, the grid uh, dura is open, we do sensory mapping, uh, we do motor mapping, electrography, uh, we check impedance, patient, wake up the patient. Uh, so, so we do all these things, so I'm not going to do, go in detail because James is going to talk about that. So, but uh, for the language part, once uh, the patient is awake, you s before you start resecting, you start talking to the patient. We do, if the tumor is in the broker's area, we try to find the power of the um, in all uh, three areas, orbitalis, so we monitor that. If the patient is in Wernicke's area, we do pictures, card, naming, auditory, visual uh, testing. And then we start resecting, and even if we're doing resecting, so all the tasks, so we are doing continuity. Either somebody is talking to the patient, so you, so you cannot do alone, so you need to have like two people because one person is talking to the patient and one person is doing the uh, stimulation. So just a sample of different pictures, you can take a picture card from different. Uh, so when you identify this for area, so the surgeon, they are putting the sticker on that. So and you are, and what we do is we make a list of that. Two is, if you're doing it's a motor, motor mapping, then you say, okay, two is hand, three is foot, one is face, whatever. Or if it's a language mapping or motor map mapping, if it's a language map and then say, okay, two or one, two, three stickers that patient has aphasia and this one patient has hesitation in this area. Uh, for the stimulation part, so this is one of the patient we did. So this is a eight by eight grid. This was, uh, and so this was sensory area. These uh, and this was this was epilepsy surgery. So it was implanted and then we came back. Uh, so this was sensory. This was motor, and these two dark blue points were the epilepsy force. So this, so the surgeon did. He took out only that area. And that neurosurgeon tells me that, okay, he's the only neurosurgeon, he does the plastic surgery because he went through the grid and resected. <laughs> Microelectrode recording for deep brain stimulation. So again, they are all awake patient, patient with the history of Parkinson, dystonia, epilepsy. Uh, you have to target the area. If it's a Parkinson, you do subthalamic nucleus. This patient has dystonia or essential tremor. You go to VIM, different nucleus, and you do single cell recording. And once we have in the in the same area, we take the recording out and put the stimulator there, and uh, leave that there. This is a DBS uh, target frame um, and uh, recording from. So I don't know. So the. Uh, the for language area or even for uh, motor mapping, so the uh, the reference point is every milliampere is equal to one millimeter. If you're getting response at five milliampere, that's mean you, that means you are f are five millimeter from that corticospinal tract. If you are if you are doing language mapping, if you are five millimeter from speech arrest, you are uh, you're getting a speech arrest at four milliampere. That means you are at as a four millimeter from that language area. So yeah, it's directly correlated with each other. That's, uh, uh, this is the second highest lake in the world. Uh, the height of the lake is 12,500 feet from sea level. Uh, and it's three hour hike. So I've been there like five times, so I love that.